Okay, let's uh, get started. Um, as usual, let's start today by talking a little bit about the, uh, the deliverables. Um, just a reminder, I pushed back the submission deadline of deliverable two uh, to next Monday night. So next Monday night, by next Monday night, you will be submitting deliverable two and deliverable three. We're not pushing back the submission deadline of deliverable three to make sure we stay on track and give you time towards the end of the semester to work on your final project. Okay, how many people have submitted deliverable two already? Quite a few of you, okay, that's fine. How many of you managed to get MPL toolkits to work? Fair number of you, okay, that's fine. So those of you that have, you're gonna be continuing on in the deliverables drawing in three dimensions. How many of you have not managed to install MPL toolkits? Only a couple people. Okay, that's good news, that's fine. If you haven't, you're gonna be continuing on using matplotlib. And you will see in the deliverables, uh, in the deliverables as we go forward, see if I can find an example of this somewhere. I think I have an old version of deliverable three. Anyways, you'll, what, you'll see, uh, what you'll see as you move forward is there'll be signs for those using matplotlib and for those using MPL toolkits. Generally speaking, for the majority of the subsequent work and the deliverables, it's not going to matter too much. It doesn't really matter whether you draw in 2D or 3D. One thing to keep in mind is that MPL toolkits and matplotlib uh, draw interactive graphics in different ways. So by interactive graphics, I mean you have your continuous loop now, your while true loop, and every time through that loop, you're modifying the visualization. For those of you that have used matplotlib or other visualization tools before, this is a little bit different because usually you create the visualization, you draw it to the screen or save it to a file and you're done, right? We're doing interactive visualization where obviously the visualization is changing based on what someone is doing with the leap motion device. Okay, both toolkits do interactive graphics differently. Uh, MPL toolkits, for those of you that have finished deliverable two, as you'll now know, adds a whole bunch of lines to the visualization, draws it to the window, and then we delete all of the lines and start again, right? Um, in matplotlib, you are creating your uh, graphics to begin with. You initialize all the lines and all the things you're gonna draw, and then you modify the X data and the Y data of those graphics in the loop. So you're modifying rather than adding and then remove it, just, just so we're all on the same page. Okay, any other questions about deliverable two? If you're still struggling with it, do come and see me during my office hours and we'll get through it. Let's move on to deliverable three, which we'll talk about at the moment. But before we do, I wanna talk a little bit more about the final project. What are you actually gonna be doing in the final project? What you're going to be doing is creating a piece of educational software that is gonna teach someone ASL or American Sign Language. So as you all know, what Leap Motion device does is because it has the two infrared cameras in it, it takes pixel information, or it takes actually two images from the two cameras, and it converts that pixel information into X, Y, and Z coordinates of the base and tip of all the major bones in the hand. So we're going from pixels to 3D coordinates, in deliverable four, next week, you're gonna be creating a machine learning algorithm that takes as input the X, Y, Z coordinates of the hand and outputs what gesture, if any, what ASL gesture is the user signing. That's the part that you're adding. So there's already some machine learning that comes with Leap Motion, which converts pixels to coordinates. You're gonna be adding an additional machine learning algorithm that converts coordinates to ASL gestures. Does anybody here speak ASL? Because we're about to abuse the language quite a bit for this course to make things a little bit simpler. Here are all the 26 uh, letters in the ASL uh, language and the first nine digits, okay? Um, you could practice if you want at home. Um, you'll notice something interesting about ASL, which is that of all the letters and numbers, almost all of them are static gestures. 
right? It, you make the sign and then you hold the sign with the exception of J and uh, Z. Okay, we're gonna try and simplify things in this course where your leap motion device is just gonna recognize static gestures. It would be a lot more work for us to recognize a gesture that's changing over time. So we're gonna rule out J and Z, and to make things really easy, we're going to rule out actually all of the letters, and your ASL system is going to teach uh, your user the digits, or the, the first 10 numbers of ASL. We're gonna restrict ourselves to that just so that we stick with all the static gestures. Okay, uh, we, since we're computer scientists, we also like zero, so we're gonna actually teach zero through nine, Zero is not shown on this. Even if you don't speak ASL, you can probably guess what the sign for zero is. Exactly, right? So we're gonna teach zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay, so that's where we're heading. So at the end of deliverable 10, you are going to have a system running on your machine that if you sign one of the 10 ASL numbers over your device, if you do it right, your device will recognize uh, that uh, that digit. It'll recognize it for you and hopefully it will recognize it for your roommate or your friend or your boyfriend or girlfriend because what we're going to do in I think deliverable five or six is collect training data from everybody in the class. So you're going to be recording yourself gesturing and we're going to be collecting that all into big, one big data set and then towards the latter deliverables, last few deliverables, you're going to be training your system to recognize not just your, your own hand signing the ASL digits, but everyone else in the class. So far so good? Okay, so at the end of deliverable 10, you have a system that recognizes ASL digits. The final project is, you to, is for you to take that recognizer and turn it into educational software. You're gonna be, and it's up to you how to do that. The goal is to try and create some educational software where you place the leap motion device in front of someone who's never seen the leap motion device before, and they start by doing this, and given what they see on the screen, they're eventually taught the 10 ASL numbers. Okay, there's one important caveat of your educational system. You can do it in any way you want. The only thing you can't do is use English text. You can't write text to the screen telling the user what they should be doing next. You're gonna be putting up visualizations to tell them what to do next, and they should be able to infer pretty quickly that you're teaching them ASL. Yes? You can put numbers to the screen? You can put numbers to the screen, that's, that's fine. Yes, we'll assume that the user may not speak English, but yes, they can recognize the digits zero through nine. Good, good question. Okay, that's where we're headed. Okay, the reason I wanted to talk about that today is because in deliverable three, what you're going to start to do now is to record some data from the leap motion device, write it out to a file, and then next week you're gonna to start to use that written out data to build your machine learning algorithm that will learn to translate uh, coordinates into actual gestures. Okay, so how does that work? When you uh, start in on deliverable three, you can watch the video uh, at the front here. I'll just sort of demonstrate how this works. At the moment, you now have a system that will draw one hand in real time, okay? You're gonna switch that to draw uh, the lines green. And then a second hand, when your second hand comes into the field of view of the leap motion device, the lines are all gonna turn red, which means recording. When you bring the second hand back out of the field of view, the lines will go from red to green, meaning the recording has been turned off. Right? Remember we talked about the cultural connotations of red and green. For our purposes, green is gonna mean it sees your hand but nothing's happening. Red means, aha, I'm recording some data. Okay, that's the basic idea. So you're gonna be adding some code that will obviously do different things depending on whether there's zero, one, or two hands uh, in Leap Motion's field of view. Okay, um, de 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 Deliverable 3 is actually quite long, so I recommend you get started on it in good time. It's long because you're gonna be doing a number of things in, a um, number of things you're gonna be doing in Deliverable 3. First thing we're gonna be doing is refactoring the code and making it object-oriented. 
because you're going to be expanding your code quite a bit between deliverable 3 and deliverable 10, and then also in your final project. So for those of you that aren't too comfortable with object-oriented programming in Python, go find a tutorial online and work your way through that uh, this week. Okay, so we're going to start um, obje objectifying our code by creating a class called deliverable. And inside that deliverable, we're going to be defining two methods, one which initializes everything we need, uh, all the drawing and, and so on, and then a second method called run forever, which just contains your infinite loop. Pretty, pretty straightforward. As you continue through the first few steps of deliverable three, you're going to be further breaking up your code into methods inside of classes. Okay. For those of you that are familiar with object-oriented programming, there shouldn't be anything too, too surprising here. I mentioned ASL, so we're going to be doing individual digits, and there's some links here for you in case you forget what they are. And as we continue on through deliverable three, we are going to come up in step number 14 to a new library that we're going to be using in, map, uh, in Python here, which is NumPy, which stands for numerical Python. How many of you have worked with NumPy before? About half. Okay, that's fine. As I mentioned in this class, we're going to be working with four uh, Python libraries. You're all pretty familiar with the first one now, matplotlib or MPL toolkits. We're going to start in on the second one now, which is NumPy. If you haven't worked with NumPy before, again, good idea. Go find a NumPy tutorial online and work your way through at least the first, first parts uh, of that tutorial. Why are we using NumPy? Because NumPy allows you to manipulate vectors and matrices of arbitrary dimensions uh, in easy ways. And we're going to capture all of the coordinates, all the bone coordinates, into NumPy uh, into NumPy matrices. In particular, we're going to be capturing a single frame of bone coordinates into a three-dimensional matrix that has five rows, four columns, and six horizontal sheets. So if you want to visualize this matrix, it's going to look like this cube on the left. Five rows, four columns, and six coordinates. Okay, you will probably spend a fair bit of time staring at this uh, figure to get this, get this all right. Let's see if we can navigate our way through this matrix. Since it's three-dimensional, we have three coordinates to designate any position within this, uh, within this matrix. What does the top row, which is highlighted in red in panel A here, capture? movements of the thumb, right? It makes sense. It's capturing information in the zeroth row of the zeroth finger. So for our purposes, we're going to deal not with the thumb and the index finger. We're going to deal with the zeroth finger, first, second, third, and fourth from now on. Okay. All right. So we're going to store all the information about the thumb for just one frame in the top, uh, in the top row. And you'll notice that there are four columns. So what does a column, what, it, what is a column going to represent for our purposes in this 3D matrix? Z coordinate. Not quite. Uh, each, bone. each bone, right? So that's a reminder. The four columns are going to correspond to the four bones. So if we have a look at, for example, if we stick with the top row, we know we're dealing with the thumb, and then we then march over 0, 1, 2, 3. We're dealing with the 0th, 1st, 2nd, 3rd bone in the thumb, which is the distal phalanx. Yeah? Remember that we're cheating a little bit in beat motion because your thumb does not have a metacarpal, so there are actually only three major bones in the thumb. So this bone here is going to have, a, it's going to store a zero length line. But just to make things simple, we're going to deal with five uh, fingers, each of which has four bones in it. So far, so good. So if I give you the first two numbers in the coordinate system here for this 3D matrix, if I give you an IJ, that means we're marching down to the Ith row and then across to the Jth column. And that 
coordinate is going to specify the ith finger and the jth bone in that finger. So far, so good? Okay, so we've dealt with rows and columns. Let's now talk about the horizontal sheets going from the front of the screen into the screen. We know that there are six elements in, or we have six of these horizontal stacks or sheets. What do those six numbers represent? Uh, the x, y, z coordinates of the tip and base of the bone. Exactly, the x, y, z coordinate of the base and the tip of the bone, right? So down here in panel C, I'm highlighting just these elements here. The first three are the x, y, and z of the base of the jf bone in the ith finger, and the fourth, fifth, and sixth element here represent the x, y, and z of the tip of that bone. Yeah. So we have 5 times 4, which is 20. 20 times 6 is it's too early in the morning for me to do mathematics. <laughs> what is that, 120 numbers? Yes, thank you. Okay. So we're going to store 120 numbers from every frame, which is going to give us all the information we need to represent a gesture in one instance of time. Now, of course, some of the information here is redundant. The base of the distal phalanx is also the tip of the intermediate phalanx. So we could compress this further. We might do that a little bit later on. But for now, capturing everything inside this matrix, which is called uh, gesture data. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna spend quite a bit of time indexing or pulling subsets of information out of this matrix in the way that I just showed you. Right? We might reference this. Uh, we might reference this variable and pull out all the information about the thumb or just the tip of one of the finger bones and one of the fingers and so on. How do we reference things in NumPy matrices? You do it in the following way. You can give specific numbers, like I've given there, which is 0, 0, 0. If I put in 0, 0, 0, I'm specifying the position of just a single element in this 3D matrix, which is this element here. So I get back one number. What is that one number? What does it represent? A point in 3D space. It's not actually a point in 3D space because we just have one number. If we want to specify a point in 3D space, we'd need three numbers. So what does that just one number represent? It's one coordinate on one bone of one finger. Which bone and which finger? Zero, 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 zero which is the zeroth bone. The base of the metacarpal of the thumb. So remember that the first zero indexes which finger, right? And the zeroth finger is the thumb. Fourth finger is the pinky finger. So we know because of the zero that we're dealing with the thumb. The second zero tells us which of the four bones in that finger we're after. And it's the zeroth, uh, it's the zeroth bone, and we count from uh, the base towards the tip. So we're dealing with the metacarpal, which we know is actually a zero length line. So we know which finger, which bone, and we're asking for the zeroth element among the six horizontal stacks. So which of the coordinates are we dealing with here? It's the first of six. This picture might help you. So we have 0, 0, which means the thumb and the base of the thumb, the basal bone, the metacarpal. And then the first of the six numbers, what is it? Not the Z coordinate. It's the X coordinate, right? So it's this one right here. And remember that the X here is the X of the base. The fourth number is the X of the tip. So if I asked instead for 0, 0, 4, I'd be asking for the x-coordinate of the tip of the metacarpal in the thumb. So far, so good? This is why you'll have to go, go back and forth between this figure and the steps in the in deliverable 3 quite a bit. You should, by the end, be able to navigate in your head where 
information is stored in this matrix. So if I give you an arbitrary position in there, like 3, 3, 5, with enough practice, you'll be able to know exactly where that is in the hand. Okay? All right. There are a few other things you're going to have to do. Is not always pull out just a single number from the matrix, but sometimes we're going to ask for subsets of the matrix. And the way you do that in NumPy is using the colon here. So as I mentioned, we have our coordinate system, which is in three dimensions. So we always need three coordinates to tell us where to go. So we're going to put in zero in the first element. And the zero in the first element tells us we're asking for information about the thumb, right? The zeroth finger. The next entry is a colon. The colon means give me all the information along that dimension. Okay? And you remember that that dimension is the columns. So I'm asking for information from the zeroth row, but I want information about all the columns in that row. That's what the colon means. I then have a colon in the third entry as well. And the third entry specifies my position forward and backward in the matrix. And it's telling me I want information from all the horizontal stacks in the zeroth row. So far, so good. So if I enter, if I ask for zero colon colon, what information am I asking for? the whole thumb, right? Give me all the information about all the bones in the thumb, exactly. If I were to put in zero, zero colon, what information am I asking for? The metacarpal, give me all the information about the metacarpal in the thumb, right? So if we put in zero, zero colon, we know we would expect back six numbers, the x, y, z of the base of the metacarpal in the, in the thumb and the x, y, z of the tip of the metacarpal in the thumb, right? So the nice thing about working with NumPy is if you cut out a slice from a matrix or a vector, it'll give you back a matrix or a vector. If I ask for gesture data 0, 0, colon, it will give me back a vector of length 6, right? All the coordinates for the metacarpal in the bone. If I were to print out this gesture data 0, colon, colon, what data structure am I getting back to print? A two-dimensional array or, or vector, however you want to think about it, right? So it's going to be a 0, 0, colon, uh, sorry, 0, colon, colon is going to give me back a 4 by 6 two-dimensional array, right? Because we've got all four bones and all six elements for each of those bones. Okay. So again, good idea to practice with NumPy and get good at slicing and dicing matrices of arbitrary dimensions in NumPy because we're going to need that later. Okay. As I mentioned, to keep things simple, we're going to rule out, uh, we're going to rule out J and Z in the ASL language to keep things simple. If we did want to capture this information, information over time, how would you need to change the gesture data matrix to capture all that information? Add another dimension. Add another dimension, right? Which then I wouldn't be able to draw, but we'd have a matrix of four dimensions. We know what the first three dimensions would be, five, four, and six. And then if we wanted to capture, for example, 100 frames while someone does this, we'd have a five by four by six by 100 matrix. If we then asked for colon, 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 50, what information would be re we'd be requesting from the matrix? The first 50 frames. Not necessarily. Colon, colon, colon tells us we want all the information about what? You want all of the information about the gestures for the left side. So if I do this, right, we have a 5 by 4 by 6 by 100 matrix. We're capturing my sweep over time for 100 frames of every of the position of all the bones in my hand for each of those 100 frames. If I pull out colon, comma, colon, comma, colon, comma, 50. It's the whole hand at the 50th frame. The whole hand at the 50th frame. I, I could ask for that information. Right? Okay. 
One last uh, item to note about NumPy that we're also going to be making use of is if you look at the third uh, index to just your data now, if you put a number before and another number after the colon, you're asking for not all that information, but just a subset. So in this case, we're asking for information about the zeroth bone. We're asking for information about the thumb. We're asking for information about the third bone, 0, 1, 2, 3. So we're asking for information about the distal phalanx, the, the bone at the tip of your thumb. And then we're asking for information um, 0, 1, 2. And then we want 3, 4, 5. What information are we asking for here? The X, Y, and Z coordinates of that bone. The X, Y, and Z coordinates of that bone, of the tip of that bone. You got it. Which is exactly what's being visualized in Z here. The zeroth, uh, the zeroth row, the 0, 1, 2, third column, 0, comma, 3, comma, 3, 4, 5. Right? Give me just the information about the tip of the distal phalanx in the bone. OK, any questions about that? OK. OK, so you're going to spend quite a bit of time. Uh, you're going to spend quite, quite a bit of time working with that and then doing a little bit of file manipulation. So once you've captured all those coordinates, all those 120 coordinates in gesture data, you're going to be writing it out to a file. And I'll skip to the end here. By the end of Deliverable 3, you're actually going to have two Python programs, one called Record and one called Playback. So um, in Record, it's going to be basically a version of your Deliverable 2. It's running that, conti that continuous while loop. It's going to draw one hand whenever one hand is over the Leap Motion device. And when my hand comes into the screen, the bones are going to turn red, but I'm actually only going to take a picture or a snapshot when the second hand leaves the field of view. So the idea is I'm practicing all the ASL gestures. I'm going to practice zero. I bring my second hand in. I make sure I've got zero. And the moment my second hand leaves, I'm going to capture all 120 numbers at that moment in time, save them out to a file. And then when I run playback, playback is not actually going to interact with Leap Motion device. It's going to look for a file, find that file, read in the NumPy matrix that's stored in that file, and draw that, that frame, that picture. Right? So I'll see my, my ASL0 that I signed. Every time that I do this, it's going to save a new gesture. So I can do, for example, 0, capture 1, capture 2, capture 3, I want to practice two again. Still not sure about two. I'm going to capture two again. We're going to generate a whole bunch of these snapshots. In deliverable four, as I mentioned, we're then going to start to build a machine learning algorithm that's going to take in all of these saved gestures. And we're going to train that machine learning algorithm that when someone new comes along and signs this, the machine learning algorithm will say, I've seen that before. That's a zero. And we'll talk about which machine learning algorithm we're going to use next week. OK. Any questions about that? Obviously, the devil's in the details. As you can probably imagine by now, there's quite a few steps to get through in Deliverable 3. Please make sure to get started on that as soon as possible. OK. That's enough about the deliverables. Let's hop back to uh, lecture. We're working our way through this uh, theme on design. How do we actually go about designing uh, HCI systems. In lecture four, we're looking at how we were looking at how design is done in lots of different disciplines and trying to draw general lessons about design from those disciplines. And then today we'll start in on lecture five where we're going to really focus on those design principles that matter for our particular discipline, HCI. Okay, so just as a reminder, we're working our way through a bunch of different domains, starting from the most subjective, like fine art, moving all the way up to technical design, and ending with interface design, which is the focus of this course. <laughs> and what interface design has in common with, for example, architectural design, is you're trying to balance subjective things and objective things. 
So one of the things that distinguishes HCI from software engineering is software engineering is mostly objective. You have a long set of written requirements about exactly what the software should and shouldn't do. And a good software engineer will take those written requirements and turn them into code. We're dealing with something else here, which is someone says, I want my interface or my system to do this, 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 and not this, this, and this. But I also want the system to be pretty usable, intuitive. I don't want to exclude anyone. Um, and so on, right? How do you design when you have those sort of subject, additional subjective requirements? Okay, so last time we ended actually with architecture, which again is a good place to start because we are, just move that over, it's a little distracting. Uh, architectural design is a good, in architecture you have to strike this balance between things that are subjective and objective, right? Clearly, in architecture, we're trying to create something beautiful. Um, beauty is subjective. So uh, here's two different buildings here. One of these buildings might look more appealing to you than the other. And I'm sure we could find a disagreement. Some people might think one building is more beautiful than the other. Which two buildings are we looking at? Is, I want to say, that, wait, like, which two buildings? This building, I'm sorry. These two buildings are the same. This is the outside, this is the inside. Is that at MIT? It is at MIT, yes. I'm a little bit more specific. The linguistics. Linguistics is in there. Linguistics is in there. So this is the CSAIL building, the CS, Computer Science and AI Lab. Um, for anyone interested in AI, this is Mecca. Uh, the other Mecca is in, in Stanford. OK. Yes? Isn't that Notre Dame? Quite. Any other guesses? St. Peter's Cathedral in the Vatican City. Yes. Okay. Two very different buildings. Clearly, there was significant effort to make these buildings not just functional, uh, like this particular building. Uh, there was also an effort to make it beautiful, given the standards of beauty in the time that the building was made. Very, very different buildings, okay? But clearly you can see, if you contrast these two buildings, um, that there's certain constraints that architects have to meet. What are those constraints? Can't fall down. Can't fall down, yes. That's, so structural integrity is pretty important, which if you want to make huge open spaces, is not an easy thing uh, to do. What else? They have to be like accessible, you know, like the, the MIT building, there are two floors, you have to have a way to get from floor one to floor two. Absolutely, right? Um, so this is just to point out again, you're going to be making something in your final project that is intuitive, hopefully engaging and beautiful, something that people actually want to work with, but there's going to be certain constraints, right? You need to be able to capture information uh, from the human hand. There's certain constraints you're going to have to meet while at the same time also trying to make it beautiful. If you look at the inside and outside of uh, the C cell building here, on the outside there's lots of curves and odd angles, but when you get inside the building you tend to see things at right angles, right? It's not the most pleasant experience to be inside a building where the floor is at arbitrary angles and there's no clear separation between the floor and the walls. Um, there was an also, also an effort in this building to blur the line between private and public spaces um, to sort of make this a much more inclusive uh, environment where it was relatively easy to bump into people and have an interesting conversation and maybe an interesting research project would come out of that. If you ever get to uh, Cambridge and you walk around inside the building, that design decision has a bit of a drawback, which is you can be walking around in a public space and suddenly find yourself in someone's office and not realize that you've moved from a public to a private space. There you go. All right. An interesting building to check out if you're ever in that part of the world. Okay. Let's keep marching from subjective disciplines towards more objective disciplines like engineering. Clearly, engineering has a lot of design principles that are at work there. Um, like software engineering and HCI, we're going to try and boil down all these sort of vague needs from our users into as sharp a set of functional requirements as possible. 
What is a functional requirement? So a functional requirement, as you would imagine, is the system should do X. The requirement says nothing about how it should do it, just that it should do it, right? It's up to the engineer or the software engineer to design what is a thing that will support X, that particular function. A functional requirement can also say the system will not do X. So you can also exclude certain functionality from your system, but as the name implies, functional requirements is a focus on functions. Which functions will and will not the system instantiate? Okay, now we're gonna to start to look at design principles, and I'm just gonna back up to the first slide for a moment of this uh, lecture series. In this, uh, in this set of slides, we're talking about design philosophy, design process, and design principles, and these are all separate things. Design philosophy is this idea about how do you, what is the best way to translate a function into a product or a service. A design process supports a design philosophy. The design philosophy says, here's the best way to do the translation. Then a design process says, okay, I've come up with a way to do this, a process to convert need into an artifact that supports this philosophy. Design principles, on the other hand, are sort of rules of thumb. They may be part of a design process, and they're important design principles as we move forward. One important design principle in engineering design is try and use modularity. When you start to create your system, best to try and create it in a modular fashion. If you remember back to last week, we described the, temple, uh, the parable of Tempus and Hora, one designed modular watches, the other one didn't, right? So there's an underlying design philosophy there, which is try and design things that don't fall apart as you go. And in order to support that philosophy, here's sort of one rule of thumb, which is make things that are modular, right? So you look at any engineered system and it's pretty modular. If you look at a car, you can see wheels and wheels are there to help with transport over flat terrain and an engine is there to convert liquid fuel into motion, right? Two separate parts of the system that do different things. It seems almost crazy to think about it, but you could almost imagine an alternate car where there was sort of a whole bunch of parts to the car and each part contributed a fraction of function to it. So you had one part, module X, that partly helped with smooth transport and motion generation and another part somewhere else on the car that also partly contributed to those functions, right? It's a kind of odd way of thinking. Modularity is so deeply embedded in the way that we build things, we often don't think about it. But in software design, it's easy to stray from this principle, right? Here's another well-designed system. We have a set of functional requirements. In fact, we have two. We want a device that should open uh, cans and another function, which is that it should open bottles. Two different FRs, FR1 and FR2. And in order to match those functional requirements, we come up with a design parameter that matches these. So we've come up with modular or separate design parts or parts of the design, design parameters. And each one, we try as best we can to have a one-to-one -one mapping for what the thing should do to the part of the thing that does it, right? Should open cans, so one part of uh, our bottle and can opener here should have a sharp point for puncturing can tops. The other functional parameter, it should open bottles, so there should be a second design parameter which is open a bottle top. Okay, connect them with a piece of metal, great. There is an implicit assumption about this machine, so it's almost so simple you can't really call it a machine, about these functions. What are they? That a human's gonna do it, right? So there's enough width there for a human hand in between. There's, a, there's another implicit assumption here about these two functions, opening bottles and opening cans. They're different from one another, right? So we've got two parts of the system to deal with these two different things. We've attached them by a metal rod, which has now welded, literally and figuratively, this assumption into the device without mentioning this assumption. What is the assumption? They're gonna be used in a similar context. 
You're going to be using a similar context, right? So there's going to be a party. There's going to be a lot of bottles, a lot of cans. They won't be used at the same time, right? Obvious, but it's never stated here. And the design has incorporated that assumption without it being said, which for here, maybe that doesn't really matter. But that is something that often happens during design. An implicit assumption gets built into a design. And it turns out that that implicit assumption doesn't always hold. We've already seen an example of this course where, where that implicit assumption went disastrously wrong. Where did we see that? The, the laser cannon, right? The x-ray beams and the lead blocks in the Therac 25. There was an implicit assumption that held up in the predecessor machine, the Therac 20, that no longer held up in the Therac 25. One of the things you're going to practice in this course is identifying these implicit assumptions, right? We want to point them out and write them down so that they're clear when we go about designing our software or our interface. Okay. All right, let's keep moving forward now towards interface design. Now we get into software design or software engineering design. Like engineering in general, we usually have a set of functional requirements. There are a whole number of design principles in software engineering. One of them uh, is that when you're programming, you should try and iterate through the cycle of coding, compiling, executing, and debugging as quickly uh, as possible. When I was doing my master's degree uh, in England, I had a friend who was in the class, and we had to do this final six-month coding project for our master's degree. He spent five months coding up his system and said, Josh, don't worry. I got a whole month at the end to debug my code. Unfortunately, he never graduated, right? So iterate tightly and often. Um, within, the, within the deliverables, I'm trying to get you to practice that. You see a lot of places in the deliverables where you add something and you run your code and there's no visible effect, right? We're trying to add little things as we go so you never dig yourself into a hole too deeply from which you cannot escape. So, uh, feeling brave this morning, let's do a little bit of live coding. I want to write a Python program that's very complicated. It's going to add two numbers together. <laughs> All right, here's prototype zero. What's going to happen when I run this code? It's not that early in the morning. It's going to print one, right? So why do we iterate tightly and often? You're also building up a mental model of what your system should do. Remember, the brain is a prediction machine. Whenever you run your code, any version of your deliverables, before you hit run, you should have a prediction about what exactly you're going to see. And if you don't see that, since you only added a small amount since the last iteration, you should have a pretty good idea about where the error lies, right? This is one of the, uh, one of the keys to being a good coder. All right, that makes sense. Small change, what's my code gonna do now? All right. What's it going to do now? Same thing. So far, so good. All right, I'm breaking my own rules here. I'm adding quite a bit at once. What's it going to do now? It's going to do nothing. It's going to do nothing different from what I did the last time. I'm not even using my function yet, I've just defined it, so now I know what this should do, and I know what I designed some to do, should do the same thing. Okay, so far so good, all right. Okay, again, pretty simple example, but at every point, it didn't take you long to predict exactly what should happen, because whatever should happen is not that different from what happened before, right? Okay, a good rule of thumb for good coding practice, okay. Here's another design principle called data hiding, where you want to hide the guts of your code away from the user interface. This is something that we're going to practice quite a bit uh, in this course. Your code is going to become pretty complicated. Eventually, you're going to test your code with a user who's never seen Leap Motion before, never, doesn't know ASL. They don't want to know what's going on under the hood. They don't need to know anything about your 5 by 4 by 6 
matrix, right? You're going to hide all that stuff away. Some stuff is easier to hide than others. Okay. I mentioned this difference between design philosophy, process, and principles. Here's a couple of rules of thumb. Here is a process, a way of taking requirements and turning it into functioning code. <laughs> if you take the sister course to this, <clears throat> which is software engineering, one of the first processes you'll see is the historically first waterfall model. Work with your users and extract from them as much detail as you can about exactly what the code should and shouldn't do. Sit down and design the architecture. What are the design parameters of the code that are going to support these FRs, these functional requirements? Implement or code up the system, test it as you go, and then deploy it. Okay. There is a philosophy that is unspoken underneath this. What is it? It's supporting a particular design philosophy when it comes to creating code for a large set of users. What is that implicit assumption or philosophy? That you're going to uh, keep repeating this process. Possibly. In the, in the original formulation, you didn't. You went through it once. Your requirements remain the same? Your requirements re remain the same, right? So the philosophy is work with your users as intensely as possible and get everything out of them as possible. Make sure everything is clear. Anything that is going to change, get it out of the way up front, right? Drain your users dry and then you don't have to repeat this process. So the philosophy is the best way to do this is to do it once. This model has more or less been discredited because it turns out that human users cannot do this, right? It's very difficult to get users to describe ex exactly what they want their system to do, especially when we're talking about the interface. So this underlying philosophy has been replaced by a different philosophy, which is go back to your users over and over uh, again. Different philosophy, and there's some very different design processes in software engineering to support that. Um, there's pair programming, extreme programming, all sorts of things that support that philosophy. Okay. Finally, we reach HCI, and we're gonna focus in this lecture and the next lecture uh, on specific design principles, specific rules of thumb, that are specific to designing the front end of your system. Like the rest of the system and engineering, we want our functional requirements. Create your, your interface, your interactive system, such that the human can complete the desired function. We still need to describe X. What is the system going to do and what is it not going to do? But on top of that, we are also going to try and maximize these global properties, which are also known as non-functional requirements. <laughs> If you study software engineering, you'll probably see that term, non-functional requirements. As the name implies, it deals with general properties of the system that aren't directly related to the specific function itself. It's do X while also being accessible, usable, acceptable, and engaging. And we're going to talk about these four in a moment. That's our design principle. What does the process tend to look like in HCI? Well, as I just mentioned, you often, for a new interactive system like Google Glass or a cochlear implant or Leap Motion, it's pretty tricky to get the user to describe how they want to use that system, what it shouldn't, shouldn't do. So in the design process, we're going to do a lot of evaluation. When you start to work on your final project in the last three weeks of this course, you're going to make your roommate very tired by going, going back and forth with them quite a bit, using them as a guinea pig, and evaluating over and over again. So if you need to bribe your roommates, start now, because you're going to monopolize a lot of their time in the last three weeks of the semester. OK, so um, how does this work? Well, we talk to our users. We might start to get a little bit of requirements from them. We start to write down the requirements. There's a lot of vagueness in the requirements. We go back to the user and ask them to clarify. They say, listen, I can't tell you. I, can, I can't tell you, I can only show you. So make a prototype or start to do some envisioning. What is envisioning? Envisioning might be write down on a piece of paper what the interface is going to look like, and you show the piece of paper to 
your user. So you might do some storyboarding before you start to create a code prototype. Physical design, so if you're, if you're creating the next smartphone or Google Glass, sometimes you'll make something out of cardboard or plastic or 3D print something that has no electronics inside. This is to get the ergonomics right. Is it something that's easy to hold, easy to wear? Depends on what you're doing, right? That's physical design. Conceptual design is trying to get all the parts of the system clear. One of the things that was not done in the conceptual design of Google Glass is thinking about the people that aren't wearing the glasses but are being seen by people that are wearing the glasses. So you might sit down with your users and tell a bunch of stories. Imagine you're wearing Google Glass in your normal day. What do you do in your normal day? Well, I go to class, I do this, I do that. Then you might start to draw out of this conceptual design all the pieces that are impacted by and, and are impacted by the technology and start to realize we need to think about people that aren't wearing the glasses but are seen by people that are. That's conceptual design, physical design, prototyping, and requirements. Main thing to take away from this slide is evaluation is central. Okay, so now let's start to talk about these non-functional requirements or global properties. We've already touched on this before, but we're going to come back to it now. These four global properties are similar and sometimes overlapping, but they are also very different from one another, and it's important understanding that they're, they're different. Accessible, who are we assuming is going to use this system, and have we excluded them somehow as we start to create prototypes and designs? So our requirements might start to say, the system should do this for this set of users under eight seconds, and for this other set of users, it should do X also, but in 16 seconds. There's something about that other demographic that's going to mean they're still able to do it, but they're going to do it in less time or in a different way. How do we make sure that we're not excluding anyone? Again, as we've talked about before, some of the things are obvious, or at least obvious in retrospect. You're designing an ATM machine. Uh, it's too high for a child, but typically a child is not using an ATM machine, so maybe it doesn't, doesn't matter. But it might also be too high for someone in a wheelchair. That does matter. Mouse might be too big for someone's hand. Joystick is too difficult to operate. Um, the leap motion device is not always obvious for someone who's seeing it for the first time how they're supposed to, to use it. Okay. These ones are tricky. Conceptual exclusion. Cause and effect relationships. When you're working with an interactive system, your brain, which is a prediction mach machine, starts to build up predictions about what uh, should happen. And your brain is trying to form a mental model. Most people, or at least people of my generation, will know that if they're given a new computer and a mouse pad or a mouse, that slow two clicks is often different from quick two clicks. Is that still true? Okay. Some, some are saying yes, some are saying no. All right, I'm already confused, right? So I built up this mental model having used a series of different computers and interfaces over time, right? What are some of the assumptions that your user might bring to your system. If you're recording data, is it always gonna record data if you do this? What about this? Is this also going to work, right? As you code up deliverable three, you might wonder and try it, try it yourself. Does your system help clarify that? Are there visual cues that are given about what's, what's happening? In deliverable three, you're gonna be recording uh, you're going to be recording the gesture when the second hand comes in. When the second hand comes in, the lines turn red, which is a little bit of a white lie. It's not actually recording yet. It only records when the second hand leaves the device's field of view. What could you add to what I've just described that would help the user understand exactly when the frame is being captured? You could flash the color to different colors. Snapshot. Absolutely, right? You could flash a color immediately when the second hand leaves, or what is another common method for this? Copy of the hand for a second where the data was taken so they can tell. You could freeze it and it, you, so the system is showing you, I just captured this. There could be a tutorial before you start. There, it shows like a little camera. there could be a little, a little tutorial. We're going to try in this course to avoid tutorials because systems that are intuitive don't need one. I was just saying, if you add sound effects. You could add a sound effect, right? The little sound of a camera taking a picture. That one is a 
uh, an audible metaphor. We've talked about visual metaphors. They're also audible metaphors, right? That sound for most people means a frame of something was just captured. It's ironic that that sound is from old cameras that no longer exist. Some of you in this room might not have actually heard a physical camera make that sound, but you know what it means. The metaphor has outlived the thing that gave rise to the metaphor in the first place. Kind of an interesting example. Okay, other obvious things, um, economic exclusion, culture exclusion, right? Making inappropriate assumptions about how people from different cultures are gonna interpret your system. We've already seen uh, we've already seen an example of that with reading left to right and right to left. Um, textual and visual analogies or metaphors or audible metaphors might be another way uh, to go. There are a lot of cultural exclusions out there. Here's an example uh, of unintended exclusion. This comes from the One Laptop Per Child program. Uh, this program is about 10 years old now. It was an attempt to create the simplest possible laptop you could imagine um, to get it down below $100, which 10 years ago was an amazing feat, and make sure, uh, in a way, to try and lower the barrier of entry for technology, computer technology to uh, underdeveloped countries and young people in those underdeveloped countries. So uh, there was a global program, the One Laptop Per Child, where these devices were made and then deployed to remote uh, villages in underdeveloped countries, where it was assumed that no one there could actually teach the child how to use the computer, because no one had ever seen a computer in the village before. It should be self-explanatory to the child. So there's the challenge. Imagine you're writing the user interface for this device. Um, and the one that, that was actually used is called Sugar. Here's a snapshot of what it looks like. If you were a child in a small village in, let's say, South America, your village had never seen a computer before. Now this doesn't hold up because you've probably seen smartphones before, but let's assume there's been no computer technology before. You're handed this magic device and you see this stuff on the screen. What does this stuff mean? What does this mean to you? Painting. painting, obviously, right? Everyone's going to be able to interpret this as meaning paint. Unless they've never seen a paint. Absolutely, they've never seen a palette brush before, right? This has got Western imperialism written all over it, right? How about this one? You don't even know what that means, you don't, you don't even know what that means right? It's chess or checkers, obviously, right? Because everyone on the planet knows immediately what chess and checkers is. This is my favorite one. What does this mean, not to you, but to a small child in a remote South American village? Volcano, right? That's what that means. And what it's really trying to tell you is you should get closer to it. The closer you get to it, the better things go. Right? It's a wireless tower. Because obviously, to all of us in the West, this means Wi-Fi tower. And you should, instead of explaining to the small child what a, what a tower is, just show them and make it clear that they should get close to it. And then they can send their artwork to their other friends on other parts of the globe, right? That's the globe. That's the globe, exactly, right? So this is you and your friends here in the village, and this is... A globe, maybe this is Mars, I don't know what this is. Hard to think. And what is this? A printer, obviously, right? Easy. Okay. Not so easy to do, right, is to actually, without writing something in English, because maybe the user doesn't speak English, through visual metaphors that work in different cultures. That is a very difficult thing to do. Remember our discussion about occlusion, things that are close are not occluded by things that are further away, or things that are further away are occluded by things that are closer? That is universal, right? We all have a human visual system. If you're old enough, you kind of understand that principle. So that visual metaphor is probably okay across multiple cultures. This, not so much. Okay, so culture exclusion is, again, one of these things that's a little bit, um, not obvious to begin with, and you've got to spend a lot of time getting this right beforehand. Social exclusion. Where is this technology going to be used? It's going to be used by a bunch of people crowding around the device. 
or one person using it uh, after the other. You know that Elite Motion device can tell whether there's zero, one, or two hands. Have any of you thought whether it can recognize three or more hands? It can. It can't, right? Well, it yes. can, but it's, uh, it doesn't do it well. Doesn't do it well, okay. So when we did it, it was like it would recognize two right hands or like two left hands, but it wouldn't really get to the third hand in there at all. It doesn't do very well with three or more hands. Part of it has to do with the technology itself, right? If you've got more hands, they tend to be closer to one another. You've already seen Leap Motion has a hard time if two hands are close to one another. But there is also implicit assumption in Leap Motion device that it's going to be used by one person at a time, right? It's an implicit assumption, but it's there, right? That may not always be the case. You might want to develop software for Leap Motion that can be used by two or more people simultaneously. That, that matters, right? So Leap Motion excludes two or more people from using the device at once. Okay, so that's about accessibility, right? How many people and what people are going to be using the technology? Usability, this one is a little bit more obvious to most people coming into HCI. It needs to be usable. If you look at the definitions for usability, you know that most of the definitions are bad because they're circular. A usable system is one which should be easy to use. That doesn't help you very much, right? Okay, easy to learn, flexible, and engenders a good attitude in people. Okay, a little bit better, but still very vague and hand wavy, right? We need to sharpen this, right? If someone comes away from using a device, uh, a piece of software, says, oh, that was super simple. I didn't need to look at the tutorial. I just got it. Why did they just get it? What was in there that made that happen? Well, in usability, what we're going to do is, is recursively unpack this word and look at specific aspects of usability. These things tend to be a little bit more specific. <clears throat> Some usability factors are efficient efficiency. So when I sit down to use your device to learn ASL, I should be able to do it in a few hours rather than a few weeks or months, right? I want to learn ASL. That's my need. I'm going to take your system, and how quickly can I learn ASL using your, your system, right? Is it inefficient? Is it making me do other things that aren't actually moving me towards my goal of learning ASL? Is it moving me in a straight path towards my goal? Effectiveness, does it contain appropriate functions and content organized appropriately? Maybe you have a system that's very efficient, but it helps me not do X, but X prime. Something that's very close to kind of what I want to do, but not quite what I want what I wanted to do in the first place. So efficiency and effectiveness are not always the same, the same thing. Easy to learn how to do things and easy to remember how to do things. One of the interesting things you'll notice when you start to do user testing your roommate comes and practices for a few minutes with your device. They leave. You get them to come back and do it again the next day. Do they remember? Do they, do they do things faster or more efficiently in your system the second time around? If they do, it's because they're remembering either explicitly or implicitly how your system works, right? So you can actually record aspects of user interaction that will tell you whether your users are learning or remembering their system. Okay. We can get people to uh, we can get people to learn things. Uh, right, easy to learn to do things and to, and to remember how to do things. What are some of the things that make a system learnable or memorable? <coughs> feedback systems. Feedback systems. What kind of feedback helps with learning and memory? Good and bad. Good and bad. Okay. So often it's just a matter of green and red. Right. Goes pretty quickly. I'm going to do a bunch of things with your Leap Motion device. Red, red, red. Oh, that's wrong. Green, green, green. Okay, I'm doing it right. I got it. Right. Sometimes you don't need a lot of feedback. Sometimes it's just simple, real-time feedback helps with learnability and memorability. What else? Audio cues. Audio cues can help. Yeah. Other things. Visual reminders of what you can do. Visual reminders, right? So we might put stuff up on the screen as a cue to remind you. Although remember our design principle going all the way back to visual design, we often want to maximize the data to ink ratio, which means if we want to maximize this ratio, we sometimes want to minimize the denominators, not put up too much ink. So some of the early software systems, they would flash, they'd have all these pop-ups. Remember to do this. Here's how you do that. Here's how you do that, which actually can end up making things 
more confusing rather than, than memorable. So you've got to be careful with visual or auditory reminders and notifications. What else makes something easy to remember or learnable? Repetition, okay, that helps, but again, we don't want to wear our user out or they will conclude that it's not very usable. If they do something 10 times until I could do it right the first time. Uh, simplicity. Simplicity, very important. Right? Um, some of you are working at the terminal on your Mac for the first time and are starting to learn all the commands that you can type in at the terminal. If you want to list all the files in a directory, what do you type into a terminal? Yeah. You don't type in L-I-S-T, which you would expect, it's L-S. You've got to remember that, right? So work at the command line is difficult, right? It's very cryptic. You've got to learn all those things for the first time. One of the things that makes things memorable or easy to use is because they borrow stuff from older systems, right? A very intuitive uh, command line system would be something that uses full English words. List, show me all the files in the directory, right? But they don't do that. It's LS and all sorts of other things. Why? Why would they deliberately make the command line so cryptic? Um, it's going against this principle. It only gets that principle, but it's increasing the first and second. It's much more efficient and effective. What you need. Exactly. Most people that are working at the command line are power users and want to do things quickly and efficiently. Right. Everything at the command line is designed to maximize these things. Forget about these things. So often there's a trade-off, again, depending on your users. If you're creating a system for uh, novice users, you probably want to emphasize this, and maybe this is not so important. Safe to operate in a variety of contexts. We've already talked about safety a fair bit. And then this tricky one, <coughs> which is utility, and it's related to this idea of effectiveness. So you're really helping people do actually what they want to get done. And sometimes what they actually want to get done is not exactly what they specified in the requirements to begin with. Most modern software systems include a lot of customizability, so you can sort of tune things for your particular way of doing things, right? You can tune up the utility of your, your system. Okay. So think about where we started here, usability, easy to use. Somebody walks away from the system saying, yeah, that was pretty usable. We now have these much more specific uh, features. Most of these, if you start to think about them, you can quantify them. You could sit down with the user and watch the user or record keystrokes or mouse movements, or you could record information of their hand over the device and use that data to measure these features. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about uh, empirical measurement as we go on. Okay, so we can start to break up usability into exactly what it means and then design a process. How do we go about achieving these or instantiating these usability factors into our system? As we've already seen in our star picture before, early focus on users on their tasks, right? Before we start to dive into the technology, focus on P, A, and C, and only then start to sketch out T. Empirical measurement, record and analyze your users' reactions to the prototype and update the prototypes accordingly. This is actually a very creative part of HCI. When you're when you do some user testing towards the end of the course, you are going to actually record data from your user about how they're interacting with, their, with your system. And then given that data, how do you map that data back to tell you how effective or not, or how safe or not, or how efficient or not your system is? Doing that, mapping back from user data, user interaction data, to your usability factors is a creative process. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. We also mentioned this idea of iterative design before. We want to design, test, measure, and redesign as rapidly and often as possible. In the last three weeks of the course, uh, try out your prototype on your guinea pig slash uh, flatmate on day one, and then make a few changes and try it again the next day, rather than waiting a week to try things again. Right? So we want to iterate as tightly and often as possible, especially with user testing. And if we're going to do this very often, your roommate's going to get tired pretty quickly, so make sure that those interaction sessions are pretty short. Right? I need you for four minutes. Use the system for four minutes. You can leave. I'm recording all the information from you as you go. Okay. 
We want to try and optimize these factors together because they are interdependent. Often, if we focus on just one factor and improve it, we're adversely impacting the other ones. Right? We mentioned one uh, trade-off already. Often making something easy to learn and use tend to op makes it less efficient. Making something more efficient often makes it less obvious or more cryptic. What are some other trade-offs that you can see here? Where does improving one of these five features adversely impact some of the others? Uh, making something safe. Absolutely, right? So if you've ever worked with safety critical systems, they often say, are you sure? Are you double sure? Take this quiz to convince me that you know that you're sure for good reason, right? They can be maddening, but they're maddening for a good reason. Okay. Okay. Here's another interesting one. Um, you know that you often have a usable system on your hands if your users verbify it. Verbification is kind of a, a meme in itself, if you like. Um, this existed long before computer technologies. When you think about a particular machine or tool like a hammer, most people say, I'm not operating a hammer. I'm hammering, right? The noun, the hammer, becomes a verb. Right? Because the hammer is so well designed for what it's supposed to do that you don't even really think about the structure itself. You think about yourself using it. It becomes, goes from being a noun to a verb or a car. You don't carring, but you, dr you drive. Right? So we're kind of related. Is Google now a verb? Of course. Right? Why? To Google something and to the extreme frustration of other search companies, you often say you're Googling when you're using other search engines, right? That's how you know Google won because it got verbified, right? When the technology goes wrong, then it stops being a verb and you focus very much on the machine, right? It wasn't your fault that you mashed your thumb, it was the hammer's fault, back to the noun, right? So when things are going well, and you'll notice, that if you pay attention, you'll notice this with your users, and you ask them to describe your system. When things are going well, they'll use verbs. When things are going badly, they'll use nouns. Your system doesn't work. This device can't see my, my hand. What are some other examples aside from Googling and verb verbification? Vacuuming. Vacuuming, that's a good one, yep. Uh, writing. Writing, excellent. Probably maybe one of the first. Yeah. How about software examples? Lots of them now. Coding. Coding, that's a great one, yeah, exactly. Tweeting, what else is there? Do you say Instagramming? I guess I guess yes. no. You do? Okay, all right, there you go. Okay. Think of it's a good one to think about. There are a lot of those verbification processes going out there. You know you have a killer app on your hand when people are verbifying your, your system. Okay, I think we'll, uh, we'll leave it there uh, for today. You have a quiz due tonight. Please do start on Deliverable 3. It's rather long, and I will see you on Thursday.